Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our second congressional briefing on family and youth homelessness in the wake of COVID-19. This is part of a virtual congressional briefing series in collaboration with the Congressional Caucus on Homelessness. My name is Barbara Duffield. I am the Executive Director of Schoolhouse Connection. Next slide, please. This briefing is co-hosted by four national organizations, Schoolhouse Connection, the National Network for Youth, First Focus Campaign for Children, and Family Promise. Next slide, please. A little bit about the logistics for the webinar. If you have a question, uh, please enter your questions in the questions pane and click send to all so that we can see your questions. We should have time at the end for any questions for our, our expert panelists. You do have materials in the handout panel. There is um, an art, you, there's a, a PowerPoint as well as some policy handouts as well in the handouts panel. And please know that if you signed up for the webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording in an email after the webinar is over. Next slide, please. So um, to, just to begin a little bit of framing, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, public schools across the country and early childhood programs identified the highest number of children and youth experiencing homelessness on record. Our public schools, pre-K through 12, identified 1.5 million children and youth experiencing homelessness. Early childhood programs identified 1.4 million. And we know there are many youth and young adults who are not in school and aren't accounted for those numbers. We do expect that these numbers to increase in the wake of the health and the economic crises caused by COVID-19. So our organizations are hosting these, three, hosting these three unique briefings to learn more about family and youth homelessness from the experts, those who've lived or are living through homelessness and those who are on the front lines providing services through education and through um, shelters and other programs. This past Tuesday, we heard from youth and young adults. Next week, we'll hear from service providers and educators. And today, we will hear from parent experts who will share their insights. We're also thrilled to be joined by, US, by two members of Congress, U.S. Representative Danny Davis and U.S. Representative um, Steve Stivers. I see, looking on the attendees, let's just see if Mr. Stivers has joined yet. I don't I'm in. see him joined yet. You're in, all right. Hello, Mr. Stivers, how are you? Good. It's our pleasure to welcome you today. We're so grateful for your leadership on homelessness and we're especially grateful for your work to address the gaps in homeless assistance and housing policies for children, youth, and families. So thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate uh, having a chance to be on the call. And I want to thank everybody for being on this call and everything you're doing, because your individual stories, uh, hearing individually from people, from families who are impacted, from children and parents impacted by youth homelessness, can make a difference for policymakers and their willingness to get involved. Uh, I know the pandemic has exacerbated many of the disparities that we were already struggling with in this country, and family and youth homelessness is certainly no exception. As the ranking member on the subcommittee on housing, community development, and insurance, one of my top priorities in, is ensuring that uh, families don't lose their home as a result of the coronavirus, and making sure that uh, families and youth who are homeless can get access to the programs that can help them uh, because a home is is so important toward our everything we do in life and and people who experience youth homelessness are less likely to graduate from high school more likely to uh, end up in prison more likely to end up um, with a teen pregnancy less likely to graduate from college or even go to college uh, and less likely to get a job so it's uh, it is such a pervasive issue that impacts so many other parts of people's lives. And um, I think it's important that we pay special care to young people uh, who right now, many of them don't have a classroom or teachers or counselors to go to. And as we all know, because the Ho Department of Housing and Urban Development doesn't define homelessness to include youth, uh, it's the Department of Education that has been filling that gap to help us identify youth homelessness so much more. And without um, uh, without schools being in session so many places, and now with the summer, 
uh, we don't have that, and it's uh, creating uh, extra problems for people that are experiencing youth homelessness. You know, I'm proud to be the sponsor of the Homeless uh, Children and Youth Act uh, because, uh, again, there are so many young people out there who are experiencing homelessness but not counted. So they're the invisible homeless uh, population. Uh, some estimates show that could be as high as 1.3 million people, uh, young people, who are homeless but are don't in, not included in the definition of homelessness under the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, so, I, you know, we need to take time to identify and help uh, young people who are struggling and ensure that uh, people on the front lines have resources to help these folks. Um, and that's why I'll continue to advocate for um, solutions for these people, uh, like the Foster Stable Housing Opportunities Act. You know, all too often we see young folks transition from foster care into homelessness because they can't even register for any housing assistance until after they are out of the foster care system. And in many cases, they are forced to be homeless. That is a tragic, tragic situation that we know we can fix. And Mike Turner's bill would fix it. That bill has passed the House. And it's important that we, uh, we get that uh, uh, signed into law. And I'm, I want to make sure we do that. We know another powerful tool on ending youth homelessness is family, the Family Unification Program. I, I'm proud to advocate for funding for that important initiative that helps combat homelessness among foster youth and prevent family separation due to homelessness. So there's so much more we can all do. Uh, by the way, Danny Davis is a great champion for homelessness. Uh, he happens to be a Democrat. I happen to be a Republican, but I, I respect his uh, record and his work on behalf of homeless folks uh, all around this country. And he's been at it much longer than I have. And I certainly respect uh, everything and look forward to working with him and all of you as we move forward to try to solve the problem of homelessness for youth and families. Thank you for including me today, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know if that's in the format, but um, if anybody has questions and that works, I'm happy to do that when it's an appropriate time. Thank you so much, Congressman Stivers. We greatly appreciate your leadership. I know it's been a long time working on the Homeless Children and Youth Act, and we'll continue to push forward with that and the other bills um, that you mentioned as well. Um, and now I want to turn um, and introduce Congressman Danny Davis, a longtime champion of children, youth, and families experiencing homelessness, and especially on the fight to increase resources for the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act and for the Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program. Thank you, Congressman Davis, for joining us today. We are so grateful for your leadership. Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here today with all of you, especially am I pleased to be with Representative Stivert, and I commend him for the outstanding work he has done in this arena, and I thank him for his very kind remarks. First of all, let me thank uh, Schoolhouse Connections, the National Network for Youth, First Focus, and Family Promise for holding this wonderful series of briefings. I'm especially pleased to join you today because Chicagoan Julie Campos is speaking about her experiences, and I look forward to hearing her insights. For me, homelessness is more than a housing issue. Given that there are multiple risk factors for homelessness, we need multifaceted policies to address it. As the chair of the subcommittee on worker and family support, within the Committee on Ways and Means, and as the co-chair of the Education and Labor Task Force for the Congressional Black Caucus, I have focused my homelessness policy effort on improving tax, education, child welfare, and workforce policies, in addition to increasing housing. Even before the pandemic, Homelessness, especially for youth and families, was increasing. Now, during the pandemic, our nation faces an exponential increase in homelessness that we must prevent. Given that homelessness in early childhood can have lifetime consequences, 
Congress must limit the harm caused to children by intervening early. I'm proud to have worked with many other policymakers to address homelessness during the pandemic. For example, I worked with Representative Yarmouth and Bacon to dramatically increase funding for the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, the Education for Homeless Children and Youth Act, and the Family Stabilization Act. I advocated with Representative Wolarski and Yarmouth to remove barriers to homeless and foster youth to get in their economic impact statements. And just last week, Ranking Member Wolarski and I successfully got flexibilities for homeless and foster youth in college in documenting their income so that they could complete their financial packages. The bottom line is that we need to recognize how families and youth actually experience homelessness and policymakers must invest substantial resources now to help stabilize and support these families and young people. I am especially eager to hear about the experiences of our young panelists, because if anybody knows what it's like they do, you do. I'm proud to be a part of this effort. Thank you very much, and I look forward to listening. Thank you very much, Congressman Davis, Congressman Cybers, for joining us today. We're proud to work with you to advance holistic policy solutions for our children, our youth, and our families who are experiencing homelessness. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Yori Berry, who is the Director of Youth Partnerships for the National Network for Youth. And Ms. Berry will moderate the discussion with our parent experts. Muted, you're muted. Muted. Um, if you could also unmute Julie, if that's possible. But thank you, Barbara. And I also want to thank Congressman Davis and Congressman Stivers for your leadership and for being a champion in transforming policies to support all people who are experiencing homelessness in this country, especially parents and children. Um, and I'm excited to moderate this conversation with April Good, Destiny Hodges, Julie Campos, and Frida Mason, four incredible parent experts, courageous enough to share both their lived experiences and recommendations for lawmakers. So we're just going to get right into it, um, starting with April, followed by Destiny, Julie, and Frida. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and your story. Hi, this is April. Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK. Um, well, I'm an African-American female, Born and raised in inner city in the uh, DMV, Washington, D.C. area. Um, I am a mother of nine. I am 40 years old. I am just coming out of homelessness. Um, <laughs> I, um, I became uh, homeless after being displaced from leaving Florida. I was married. Um, I'll take you back a bit before I got there. Like I said, I grew up in the D.C. area. Um, I did not have parents. I was a foster kid myself. I was completely lost. Um, needless to say, at about 31, I decided that I was going to pack my life up. I moved to Florida, did something different, and have been advocating and been a social advocate um, in Florida for the last eight years. Um, never expected uh, to experience, started civic organizations, adopted streets, and have been completely advocating for everyone and every policy I could think of socially um, and economically where I just came from. And in six months, my life flipped upside down. I lost my home. I lost my marriage. I relocated to New Jersey thinking that I was getting into a better situation for myself and then everything went away. I have four minor children um, that are with me and needless to say, I ended up um, homeless um, in the dead of winter in New Jersey with no family, no options, um, just devastating homelessness to the point where we were sleeping in a vehicle. Ended up in hotel placement and um, it's it's been a whirlwind um, from there. 
I know we only have two minutes, so I'll give someone else time to share. Destiny. Tell us about yourself, your family, and your story. You entered. No digits. You're muted. <laughs> Julie, can you hear me? Julie, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, tell us about yourself, your family, okay. and your story, and then hopefully Destiny will be in to go out. Okay. Well, my name is Julie Campos. I have uh, a one-year-old. His name is Miguel. Um, I live in Chicago, Illinois, born and raised. I um, I actually experienced, started experiencing homelessness when I got pregnant. Um, and I got pregnant because my um, stepfather had been abusing me since the age of 13. So, um, when my mother found out, she kicked me out, and she found out when I was eight months pregnant, so I was already, like, very far along. Um, she didn't care about anything that had happened, so she kicked me out, um, and I ended up going to a shelter um, called the Night Ministry, um, which was really, like, helpful towards me, but it really, um, like, messed me up because I had never experienced homelessness before and it was really hard for me um for it to be while i was pregnant and having no communication at all with my mom or my sister um at all and just seeing her still seeing my mom still have a relationship with her husband was really hard for me and i was still trying to go to school so i was a full-time student at harold washington college i'm trying to get a major in early childhood education um that's one of my main goals. I want to become a teacher. Um, and I just want to, you know, be an example for my one-year-old because he's the only person that I feel like is looking up to me right now. So, yes. Thank you for that, Julie. Destiny, can you hear me now? We can't hear you, and I'm not sure why. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a couple things that hopefully will help. Just a second here. Thank you. Okay, let's see if that makes a difference. Destiny, can we? Let's try again. We still can't hear you. We'll go to Frida. We'll come back to you. We will get to you. We will get to your story. We're going to figure this out. But Frida, if you could just tell us um, a brief introduction. Hey, good afternoon. Can y'all hear me? Yes. My name is Frida Mason. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I just turned 38 this past Tuesday. Um, I'm a mother of five children, a 17-year-old girl is my oldest, and I have four boys, one 13, one 11, one 9, and one 6. Um, well, my past life, I actually grew up in a foster home, but I made it out of that terrible situation, and I ended up graduating from high school. I graduated from college. I started my own child care business. And um, that's how I was getting my income. I was actually very successful. Um, I completed some of my goals. I was in nine movies, which was a big thing for me because that's what I always wanted to do. Um, I had a good life until I hit the age of 35 and my uncle passed away, to my, passed away in my home. So when he died in my house, 
it sent me into a depression. After that, I kind of like lost it a little bit. I lost my job and I ended up losing my apartment. By me paying market rent, it was hard for me to get another apartment. Everybody was always saying the eviction got to be three years old. So I ended up becoming homeless, um, going from house to house, hotels, sleeping in the car or whatnot. And right now, I'm still currently homeless, basically kind of due to COVID-19. And I'm just hoping all of this COVID goes away. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. Destiny, we have you now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, finally. Welcome, welcome. Tell us about yourself, your story, anything that you just want to share. Um, um, I, my name is Destiny Hodges. I um, I love school. I mean, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I have one nine-month-old daughter. Her name is Kelly. Um, I'm recently enrolled at Delgado Community College. Um, I was in foster care, and I became homeless at 17 from my foster parents who adopted me at 11. And I was experiencing um, secret abuse in the home, sexually and mentally, and I was just really like fed up with it. So I had to leave. So I went to stay with a friend that was horrible. Then I had to graduate from high school from my friend's house. And then after that, I was working job here and there. Um, I moved, I came back, and I was just really running around living pillow to post until something kind of set my spirit and say go to Covenant House. And Covenant House is the um is the only youth organization in New Orleans. Uh people from like Thibodeau, Louisiana and Gonzalez has to come all the way from out there to come out here because it's the only youth shelter in Louisiana. And um me being at the company house gave me a lot of peace with myself and i found myself i was very depressed when i came here though because me being in the shelter really made me kind of sad but i had to raise a daughter and i was six weeks months pregnant so i had to just swallow all of that and also i um did get help with housing at the covenant house so yeah Thank you, Destiny. Um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into your stories. April, if you could share with us um, a bit about your homelessness experience before the pandemic. April, I'm not sure if you're speaking, but if you are, you're definitely muted. The sound is not on okay. I'm side. here. I'm here. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> sorry. Um, so pre COVID, once I became homeless, I was staying with a friend um, who was living in a relative's home who the home was sold. So that immediately, like I said, the person who owned the house passed away. It was willed to someone else. So that left myself and my four children um, homeless. Um, and like I said, in the dead of winter in New Jersey, and unfortunately, because I had not had a prevalent history, except for, well, of course, when I was younger and a minor, but I haven't had a prevalent history of being homeless. It affected me negatively so uh, unbelievably so. I could not get help because um, I was not on drugs. I could not get help because I was not beaten or battered. I could not get help because my children did not have uh, health or mental disability. And so all the things that I would think would take me a step further because I am okay mentally, my kids are okay and they can function. None of those things um, were to any benefit to get help. Um, there's this national hotline that you call and once you tell them these things, it places you lower and lower on the list, even though I had nowhere to go, nowhere to be. Um, not having any sort of disability, not being drug addicted um, was held against me. and so. I was denied benefits because 
I did not meet the criteria that was, you know, set in place, I guess, in the state of New Jersey. And I was, it was just unbelievable. And I mean, I became completely, you know, depressed. I, I, I finally ended up getting um, hotel placement. When I got hotel placement, they placed myself and four children in a, a one room with two beds with no kitchen, no access to a local grocery store. I had no vehicle. It was freezing. Where's the local pharmacy? None of that information is given or shared with you. You're just, you know, placed. I was placed um, about 45 minutes from where my children went to school with no vehicle. And even though the school system is supposed to pick your kids up um, because that's the homeless law for children, that didn't matter. That's still a process. So for two weeks, I had to figure out how to get my kids back and forth uh, 45 minutes from their school until transportation got set in place, which it eventually did. But that stopgap, it was devastating um, to my children. They were completely disgusted with me. They had lost hope in me. They lost faith in me. And this was all, you know, pre-COVID. Like I said, there was no kitchen. There was, you know, no local grocery store. It was just, you know, terrible access. But had I had a disability, I could have been on another list. Had I had, my kids had a disability or I've been beaten, I could have been placed somewhere. But because um, I was employable and I didn't have those issues, all of those items were um, held sort of against you in, in seeking place. Thank you, April, for sharing. And during this time, I, I, I hear you saying that, you know, you have to figure out a lot of these things on your own. Were there any supports in place? Were there any programs or people that were able to assist you or your children during this time? Unfortunately, not as of yet, because until you can be deemed needy of the help or till you can prove you need the help, you don't have access to the programs. You have to be able to receive benefits. So say, for instance, uh, cash assistance and food stamps, you have to be approved for those things before the agencies and the programs are allowed to help you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Julie, um, to you, tell us a little bit about your homelessness experience prior to the pandemic um, and any support that were available or in place to help you. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, like I said before, I got kicked out from my mom's house when I was eight months pregnant. So, I actually had texted um, my high school teacher, um, my English and I, I told him about like what I was going through. He was the one that told me about the shelter that I was at. Um, and it was, I got really lucky with the shelter that I went to because I made like incredible friendships, incredible relationships, but it was still really hard for me, um, especially because I was only pregnant for a week when I got to the shelter, a week after I had my baby. So being with my newborn at a shelter was really hard for me. And I was trying, like, I, I went back to school a semester right after I had him. So, like, I put my baby in daycare when he was, like, two months. And, you know, as a first parent, it was really hard for me because I didn't want to leave my baby alone. And I didn't have anybody to take care of him. So I didn't know whether I should go back to school or not. But um, luckily, I have, I had very good, like, relationship with the people from the shelter I was at. Um, I found him his daycare, but being homeless and being with a newborn was two things that I never want to ever experience again. And it was really hard. You know, I was in that shelter for six months. Um, so my baby spent his first six months of life in a shelter with no family. And it was just really hard for me. But, um, after those six months, I got pulled for housing. Um, I currently live in my own apartment with my baby, but it's still hard because now, because of the pandemic, we can't really have any like visitors or help or anything. Um, and I feel like a lot of the times people from the building that I live in, we don't get as much help. Um, but before the pandemic, my experience was 
I feel like not as bad because because of the help that I received from the shelter and different organizations that I got help from. So I was very lucky in that like place where I did have like people to help me and I, I didn't feel like I was as alone as I actually was. Thank you for sharing. And you said different organizations helped you. Which organizations were able to help you during that period? So I actually, um, I joined this organization called New Moms, which is um, an organization for moms where I would go to like parent classes every week and I was able to get like free diapers or free baby wipes or free formula if I needed it. Um, I will also join this other organization um, from called um, Aid for Women. So when I every time I would go to Aid for Women, I was also able to get like stuff for my baby if he needed clothes or if he needed toys. Um, and it was also again like I would just go to classes, weekly classes. You know, we would watch a video, and I was very lucky to have that because I didn't have a job, so. I didn't have any like income to buy my stuff, my baby, the stuff he needed. So I was very lucky to find those organizations to help me out. Thank you. Um, Destiny, how about you? Um, tell us about your homelessness experience prior to the pandemic, any support that you were able to receive in New Orleans. Um, I was able to receive support <clears throat> in New Orleans, but some of the things, um, some of the barriers, or I would say hinders that, that hindered me from finding housing was not having anyone in my corner after foster care. So um, when I did come to the Covenant House and I received housing during COVID, the only thing that impacted me was not uh, being able to be hands on with school because um, the, my major is really hard, so I have to like be hands on. I'm a um, I'm a hands on learner, and when I got to do something online, I kind of my brain kind of shuts down, and um, it made me not really able to focus. And then every, my um, nanny died from due to Corona too, so I was mentally like out of it. I couldn't even do it mentally. But I can say that the Coven House has held me up um a lot during COVID and has um, called and asked if I needed any food. Um, I have been getting mental health from a therapist at the Covenant House, has been coming to see me weekly. So that's something that um, that helped me as well along the way with uh, the pandemic and stuff. Um, and I also got into a really bad altercation with my um, child's father. He was very abusive as well. And I was in the hospital, so that's another thing that um that was prior to the pandemic. That was like right before the pandemic happened, probably in March, right before this uh, shutdown. And um, it was hard because I had to go to the hospital, and my air jump was busted, and um, I was limping. I couldn't walk, and I had to go by Corona people who had COVID, you know, and be in there with them, and be probably able to catch it but i was just in there with peace because i know that i was going to be better but it was just hard for me as um before the pandemic mentally so when the pandemic happened it um and it, it impacted me even more mentally thank you for sharing frida how hello yes i can't hear you Okay. So um, a little bit about my homeless experience. Well, it had a lot of downs to it because I am a single parent of five kids. So here in Cincinnati, Ohio, they don't have a lot of family shelters. They only have shelters for single individuals who is on alcohol and drugs. And by me not being on alcohol or drugs, and I don't look like I'm homeless, it was hard for me to get help. Everybody kept turning me down. I did have a part-time job. Um, that's actually how I survived. I tried to stay with my sister, but it didn't work out. 
I got five kids. She had a lot of kids and she had a abusive boyfriend that was there who was verbally and emotionally abusive. So I couldn't take it there anymore. I would have ended up in jail. You know, I can't have nobody mistreating my kids while I'm trying to make money and make sure they go to school with stuff. So um, I started sleeping in hotels. Here in Cincinnati, the Free Source Food Bank helped me for a week. Their funding ran out. They didn't have a lot of funding. There's a lot of homeless people in Cincinnati. So that program was the only program that helped me with um, shelter for a week. Throughout that whole first year of me being homeless, I did get help with food from certain places like St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Seven Hills Neighborhood House, um, the Vineyard Church, a couple of churches, uh, making sure I have food. And even Children's Hospital uh, gave me a couple of um, gift cards for food. Oh, and also I cannot leave them out. They've been a big help with um, getting my kids back and forth to school, book bags, school supplies, Project Connect. Project Connect has helped me out. They couldn't help me with shelter, but they helped me out with stuff that I needed for my kids so they could stay in school. That was a big thing for me. That was the only goal. Out of all these downfalls of being homeless, and the, the thing that I was worried about is two for one kids. I didn't want my kids to be taken away from me just because I'm homeless. So I, I made sure that they went to school every day. They stayed in sports. That's what kept my kids going and to get their focus off the homeless situation. Um, I'm sorry. I'm having a brain freeze right now. Okay. So um, I realized we have a a homeless hotline here called 381-SAFE. It's supposed to be for family. I will call every day, every day for a whole year. I called. I told them my situation. They know I got five kids. And I, I, I realized they kept asking me, like, well, where did you sleep at night? And I'm like, well, me and my kids slept on somebody's floor. Okay, we'll call you if we got some available. No calls. And then I realized I actually got a lot. I started saying we slept outside. Some nights we did sleep outside. But that's when I noticed these people, they're not trying to help me unless I'm sleeping up under the bridge or something. So I had to start saying that. And actually, a year and a half later, is when they actually gave me a chance. I kept saying, I'm sleeping outside, I'm sleeping outside. They put me um, in a family shelter. I was actually in there for one day. It was so filthy, unsafe. The doorknobs was broke. Beds was broken. I couldn't even sleep. I, I, it was too unsafe for me. So I went on ahead and left. And I found somebody house to stay over, and then COVID hit. Yeah, and that's where we are right now. Um, everything that you've described, right, um, a lot of obstacles, a lot of barriers, people and programs supporting you the best way that they can, but a lot of times having limitations, right, having to lie just to get the support that you need. Um, but as we all know, whether we were experiencing homeless or not, or not when COVID hit, things changed and things shifted for a lot of people. How did the pandemic impact you and your children, April? Wow. Um, the pandemic was devastating. By the time the pandemic had hit, I had been approved for benefits. I was placed in, like I said, hotel shelter placement um, February the 20th after um, much like the last guest just shared after you know lying and saying okay I'm in the car tonight and continuing to call and they finally gave us hotel shelter placement which was far away um, they closed down the schools they'd started this online school my kids could not do it because we were in hotel with unstable Wi-Fi so I couldn't have four kids not to mention I didn't have computers the school district thankfully, two weeks later was able to uh, give the kids loaner computers. Um, but, you know, 
I was out trying to like find a job, even still in the midst of the pandemic on the train. They were complaining, we can't log on, the internet's not working. It was just horrible. You know, I'm, I'm gonna give you guys an, an, an instance that was just completely unbelievable. And I, <laughs> I was so depressed, my kids were depressed. I watched my nine year old son lay in the bathtub on a sleeping bed, I mean sleeping bag because he did not wanna be in the same bed as his 10 year old sister because he's a boy. I was so depressed, I went downstairs, there's a, a bar downstairs in the hotel. I went down there and I sat down there and I guess, you know, truckers, because where they place you doesn't matter. People from all over can come in. So you can't let your like kids, you know, outside. They hadn't closed down the place yet. So I'm down there and I'm just looking sad. I'm just, you know, sitting in, in the area and someone who is staying there who has seen me, you know, before with my kids seeing us come in and out, you know, he, he comes over and he's, he's speaking to me and he's he's looking at the homelessness on me. He's looking at the desperation and the, 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 the pain, and now he wants to pray. So now he says some things that are offensive because he feels like he can help my situation and no level of, of, of homelessness should create that type of shame. You know, here I am and somebody can just look at me and see the homelessness on me while I'm here dragging these kids uh, through this hotel, five of them that, Four, I'm sorry, four of them who just have all these people, you know, coming in and out, construction workers. I got teenage daughters. And so because I look desperate, they just assumed, you know what I mean, that I would I would go for anything or I would do anything. I walked out of that place with, I can't even be, begin to explain the level of shame I felt. And one thing I want you guys to understand about homelessness is that every every feeling, every notion that you experience can't be statistically measured. It just can't be statistically measured because there is no way that you can measure the feelings of hopelessness that people are feeling homeless during this pandemic. My kids couldn't leave the room. They couldn't go to the ice machine. There was nothing. We were on the highway, Route 46 in New Jersey. We were on the highway. There was no park to take them to. There was no place to run. I stayed in that hotel from February the 20th until April the 16th. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I Forgive me. I stayed in the hotel from February the 20th until June the 16th. And so my kids had nowhere to go, nowhere to be, no outlet. I found a job. They were angry at me because I'm leaving and they can't. It affected me in ways my daughter was drawing mortifying pictures and just being depressed. I had to put myself in therapy to be able to balance so that they didn't see the pain in my face every day. And I'm 40. I can't imagine what some 20 year old is doing in the room locked in with her kids. That's where the options come in. That's where people give up on themselves. Hopelessness sinks in and they do things that they don't wouldn't necessarily or generally do. This COVID and homelessness has, has become so devastating. Thank you. Thank you for sharing April. Um, you mentioned the, the, the hotel having spotty Wi-Fi and not having access to technology. I'm just curious, um, how how did the, you know, how did your children make it through that? Was there any support that whether it's an organization or a school was able to provide just so that there wouldn't be more learning loss during during that time specifically for your children? At that time, just pre-COVID, I had signed up for a program called Family Promise. Family Promise was getting ready to place me um, in their program. However, the way their program works is that you stay at shelters at night in a day center during the day. I'm sorry, uh, churches at night in a day center during the day. Well, COVID came, and so they couldn't do that. So what ended up happening is, even though they couldn't place me or take me physically into their program, they started to provide me other services. They started to they they brought me a, a printer and printer paper um they came and they brought school supplies um i didn't have a kitchen there's a they place you in a hotel room with a kitchenette so if you only you can only buy tv dinners you know there wasn't anything that you could feed you know your kids and so family promise has a program where they actually have volunteers of people who cook families dinner and bring them to you every night and so that that is that became helpful and they brought school supplies and things like that. So um, 
I was able to communicate with the schools that my kids were going to and ask them if my kids could actually physically just do the work and I drop it off to the different schools or someone meet me to pick up the work because they couldn't work online. It was just impossible with the hotel Wi-Fi. Um, and then my kids just became so discouraged. They just didn't want to do the work at all because they felt so hopeless. I had nothing to take away from them if they didn't do their work. <laughs> what was I going to take away? Nothing. Yeah. Thank you. For, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Julie, how about you? Can you tell us how the pandemic has impacted your experience, specifically for you and your little one? Yeah. So um, when COVID hit, I was actually still in school, like the semester was not over yet. So um, our professor just, I was only taking one class at the time because um, they took my financial aid away when I dropped out of school when I had my baby. And when I went to talk to the financial aid office, they said, well, you know, there's nothing we can do because you still enrolled in school, even though you knew you were going to have your baby. So they had me on probation for the next semester. And then they just completely took my financial aid away and I was not working. So I didn't have money to be full time enrolled in school. So I was only taking one class. And um, when COVID hit, we ended up um, changing our classes to online classes. And it was really hard because I was at home with my baby. He was like just starting to crawl. I didn't have no internet at home. And it was like, I can't, I can't even like take my classes. And if I'm paying for this class out of pocket, then like I have to pass it because I'm not going to just waste my money. So I ended up, you know, emailing my school, letting them know. Um, they actually ended up sending me a Wi-Fi box saying, OK, we're going to like let you borrow this Wi-Fi box um, for you to finish this semester. And then you're going to have to send it back when the classes are over. And I was like, OK. So I was able to finish my class online um, for the rest of like the, what the semester was. Um, because of COVID, it was even harder for me to apply for jobs. I had already been looking for a job ever since I gave birth to my baby. But um, me being, I was like 18 when I had, um, when I started like, you know, looking for jobs and stuff. And the, they would always tell me the same thing, like, oh, we need someone with experience. You've never had a job, you've, you know? And I'm just like, well, I need a job. Like I need experience. You like. A lot of places don't want to hire you because you've never worked before. And so I had an even harder time looking for a job. And then um, I decided to just take a break from school because I had to save money so that I could go back to school next semester. I finally got hired about a month ago. I started working at a family dollar store and it's like so hard because I'm like so scared that I catch something and I come home to my baby and my baby is so small. Like his immune system is not even like healthy enough to fight something. So it's like really scary for me to go to work every day and come home and feeling like I'm not, you know, like being, I'm not able to take care of my son. Like I want to. So, um, now my school has been emailing me too, saying like, oh, we're only doing classes online. And I know classes online, my one class was really hard for me. So I know if I become a full-time student online, it's just going to be too much. If I have my baby here with me, he's not going to, He, my one class I was taking, it was really hard for me. I didn't know whether to pay attention to my professor, write my notes or take care of my baby. And it was like really hard. Like I didn't know what to do. And I feel I felt like my school was not even understanding of my situation. I went and I told them I was homeless. I took them the letter from the shelter. I took them letters that I needed, like, you know, my financial aid back. And they they literally just said, you know, there's nothing we can do because they pretty much just said it was my fault. And it's like, you know, like I felt like at that moment, I felt like, what do I do? Do I just drop out of school? I don't want to drop out of school because I want to, you know, give my son a better future. So what do I do? Do I work? Do I go to school? Do I take care of my son? And it was just like a very like hard situation for me because you just don't know what to do anymore. You don't know what to put your priorities first, you know? Um, and now like I can't even, because of the pandemic again, a lot of the resources that I had before 
I didn't have them anymore because they stopped. I couldn't go to Aid for Women to get diapers for my baby. So it was like, what is my baby gonna wear now? New moms, they stopped the home visits because of the pandemics. And it's just like, okay, well then where am I gonna get my baby the stuff he needs if I'm not working? I keep applying here and I apply there and I don't get hired anywhere. Like, what am I gonna feed my son, you know? Um, but now, like, I guess things are starting to like calm down a little bit. And I started working. Um, hopefully I save money to go back to school next semester because I don't want to completely drop out of school. Even if I am only taking one class at a time, I just, it's just something I want to do. I don't want to stop going to school. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Destiny, how about you and the impact of the pandemic on you and your daughter? So as I said once before, it was school that impacted me and my sanity too, because um, when you're in um when you're in quarantine, you're thinking about a lot, and mentally that can be draining. That can be a good thing, and that can be a bad thing. But to, for me, it was a bad thing because I had a really hard and dark past. So this this COVID going on helped me think about my past and helped me think about school and how I wasn't doing the best because of everything that was going on. How I wasn't the best mom because. My baby was teething and I wasn't able to go and get nothing for it because I was broke. That's before that. That's before like the government started being really generous, giving out stimulus and stuff. So I didn't have nothing um to help my baby with. I barely had milk. I I didn't. I actually did not have milk because my wig card um was stolen by my child's father. So I didn't even have my wig. So yeah, I had to start back breastfeeding. No milk was coming out. I had to find things. For her to eat, I had to borrow milk from a friend. It was just really a lot that impacted me. Um, I did not want to get her. To, I did not want to get her sick. And I had, uh, I don't have family members like that because I was in the foster care system as well. But um, I had like a few friends. I mean, to get by. And but it, it, it but it impacted me um, mentally um, good too because it helped me to get some faith. And things was like not in my favor in the beginning of the well during COVID it nothing was in my favor. And then things started like unraveling and things started like getting better as I kept having faith. Um so I am happy that uh, that happened. It's just that my housing situation was the only thing that kept me going. Because if I was living with someone else or if I was in a shelter, I know that I probably would be like rock bottom because I just going through a COVID, I mean, going through a pandemic and being underneath someone else's roof is very, very like. So that's one thing that I am very thankful about. Um, it impacted my employment because I didn't have anything to provide to my daughter. And I was working when I was pregnant, but I wasn't working enough. So I didn't have nothing saved, nothing to fall back on. I didn't have nobody but me. My, my, my baby is all I she have. She doesn't have nobody else, like no, no grandparents, nothing, just me. So I had to just, everything I had, had to just give, keep giving it to my child, which is not a problem. It's just that I don't have anything left to pay my bills with. I don't have nothing left to get milk, stuff that she really need. Um, so I found an organization and when I got, when I did get my car back, the lady at the wig office gave me free diapers. She gave me um a free Starbucks card for coffee, and she gave me a couple other little goodies in the bag, and that helped me out tremendously. But I am thankful for the Coven House a lot because they had they have texted me and asked me did I need anything due to Corona and did I need anything for Kelly. So that has helped me a lot too. Um, when they started, when they started seeing that how bad the pandemic was affecting their residents and people that they have, have housed, they had to put their you know foot in, and they have been a really big big help for me. So. Thank you so much for sharing, Frida. How about you? Um. Okay. How did the COVID impact the homeless situation? Well, um, before the COVID hit, I was in the process of making a turnaround. Like I said before, I had a part-time job. So with that part-time job, 
I couldn't even, I didn't even have enough income to get a market rent apartment where I say a three bedroom is 900, but one bedroom is 750. So I didn't have enough income to get a um, market rent apartment. I was in the process of getting new jobs. Uh, I went to school to be a, and what was that, like January, February, I was going to school to be a network infrastructure technician. So I'm like, with this trade, and I'm already interviewed with a couple of people, they ready to hire me, I'll be able to afford an apartment. But boom, COVID hit. They shut down. I still end up graduating and getting my certificate, but I couldn't get the job. Everything shut down here. All the programs for homelessness shut down. Uh, apartment building offices shut down, so you couldn't go in and fill out an application. The federal building shut down, so I couldn't get social security cards and uh, job and family services shut down. I couldn't get the stuff that I need to move forward. I got to say um, with the schools, the schools did shut down, but we was able to get tablets. Our um, cable company here is called Spectrum. Spectrum was giving out discount Wi-Fi for Cincinnati Public Schools. So my kids were still able to go to the online school with the discounted Wi-Fi. And um, I also had teachers, because they, they knew I was in a homeless situation. They would come and drop off packets, work packets for my kids to do. So all my kids passed to the next grade, thank goodness. But um, with me, like I said, I'm staying in someone else's house who is afraid of the COVID, which is difficult. Me and my kids sleeping on the floor. My kids tired of sleeping on the floor. They don't want to see me go. And also, I did get sick. I had to quarantine for 14 days in somebody else's house. So that was, like, really kind of difficult. I couldn't work. I wasn't getting no income in. The only thing that I was getting was uh, help with school, since night public schools, they helped me with school, and also Project Connect. Um, I didn't get the new jobs. I had two new jobs lined up um, with Children's Hospital and with the Census Bureau. I got hired for them, too, but they shut down due to COVID, and they still shut down at the moment. So I haven't been able to start those. Um, So, um, also, I didn't have no transportation. The metro buses, they kind of ran when they want to run, you know, because of the COVID. So it was hard to get the jobs, get to the places that I need to get to, thanks to the uh, stimulus check, I was able to get a van. I could have tried to get an apartment, but like I said, the office was shut down. I wanted to be mobile so I can get to where I need to go. So I invested my stimulus check into a van, and that has helped me out tremendously. But right now, I'm still in someone else's apartment, and they gave me to the end of July. I got to the end of July, and I got to go, which I respect that. You know, some people, they don't want to catch COVID. They don't, they afraid because I still got my part-time job and I work in a grocery store. People at the grocery store in my job, my Amazon, they've been catching COVID. So every day I worry about catching it and I don't want to bring it back home to my five kids, but I still got to make money so I can try to save up and still try to support me and my five kids. So that's how it's affecting me. Some stuff here is still shut down. It, it just slowed me down tremendously. Thank you, Frida, for sharing. Um, Congressman Davis, I didn't know if you had a question. I saw you nodding intently. I didn't know if you had a question or comment that you wanted to make right now. You're muted. No, can't hear you yet. 
Okay. We can hear you uh, now. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I was just thinking. I've participated in hundreds and perhaps thousands of hearings during my lifetime, but I've never been as impacted by any of them that I've ever been in before to this extent. It just occurred to me that each one of these young women are absolute sheroes, real troopers, who in spite of odds have demonstrated the real essence of personhood and are people to be admired, respected, and assisted in any way that we possibly can. I mean, you renew within me a desire as well as an effort to try and convince all of my colleagues and all of those who are decision makers anywhere around the country to do more, to find additional money, additional resources, create additional ways and approaches. So that's what I really wanted to say. And I did want to ask Julie one question, because I am familiar with the organizations. I see the night ministry almost every day when I leave out of my office. They're often parked out on the street doing things for people. They, I think, they were the first organization that you came into contact with or made contact with how helpful yes. were they to you what what were they Very. really able to do for you well um other than like providing like the resources like they're the ones that told me about new moms they're the ones that told me about aid for women they're the ones that helped me get on the waiting list so i could get my apartment they're the ones that took me to the um the public aid office to apply for my link card when i got denied my case manager went with me again like you know like they really went out of their way i joined their uh youth for truth um cohort i did three cohorts i went to their national conference in florida this past november um, and other than just giving me like resources, they were just like, you know, like it just feels like they treat you like a human. Like they don't just see you as a homeless youth. Like they see you as a person. And like, I really made friendships with the people in there, not just, oh, like, you know, you're my case manager. You're going to help me get this. Like, it wasn't even just that it was, I really made friends there and not even friends like you know a lot of them feel like family like you know we celebrated my baby's one year old they got him a cake and it's just like it's so that's why i feel like i got so lucky that the night ministry was the the organization that i was in because they were so helpful and so like caring and nice to me um, you know, like, being 19 being sexually abused for over five years, it really makes you feel like you're worthless. I never ever in my whole life thought I was gonna be homeless with a one-year-old. Well, bless you all. I've got to run off to another meeting, but you're all champions, real champions, and you are a credit to the human race. Thank you so much, and I've got to run. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I was muted. Thank you, Congressman um, um, Davis, for your words. Um, and thanks to all of you for sharing, for your courage, for your resilience, to just speak your truth better and more leader um, and policy. Before I turn it back over, Barbara and we open it up to the attendees for Q&A. 30 seconds or less. What is the main thing you want leaders and policymakers to know and consider when they are designing housing options and resources for parents and families like you? 
April. There's no box. There's no box. When I think about the questions, and I understand that they have to have a template and they have to start somewhere. But I think that, you know, this whole idea or concept that battered, abused, disabled, uh, the, the, the face of homelessness is not the same. I'm very well spoken. I had an eighth grade education until I was 32 years old. I went back to school for my kids' sake. I'm employable. I'm hardworking. I don't have a, a, a negative history or a criminal record, but I wasn't exempt from being homeless. And so the face of homelessness is, is, is just not what, what people imagine it to be. It's not missing teeth. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's not what it used to be anymore. And I think that cap has to just be removed. And when they sit down and think about the questions and how they survey, because um, like a senator was saying in the beginning um, of the meeting is that we don't get counted. You know, my biggest hardship throughout the whole process is I didn't count. You know, if I wasn't able to advocate for myself, I I honestly don't know where I would be. So if I was a 21 year old girl or an 18 year old girl, I would have been completely lost in my situation in the dead of winter with my children. And so that affects me when I think about the fact that <laughs> It, it just, it doesn't have a face. I'm glad that I, I mentioned earlier that you can't see me because homelessness has no face, the one you see now. I was muted. Thank you, April. Julie. Yeah, well, I just want a lot of well, I guess the people that are the ones that make these decisions and these choices to know that, like, there's a lot, kind of like she said, there's not, you can't point someone and just say, you know, they're homeless for a reason, because you don't know the reasons. A lot of people just think, especially I feel like with young moms, they think, oh, you know, she must have been doing crazy things or stuff like that and there's a lot of different reasons why we're going through what we're going through and it's not our fault you know like a lot of times people like to blame us and say that we're in here because we did something wrong and you know it's that's not the case and i feel like a lot of the times people are just not understanding of why everything happens thank you julie destiny um, what do I want some policy makers to change? That's, that's the question is. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, some things they can change are safe havens for kids. Because when I was growing up, and I'm I'm 21 now, but when I was growing up, my adoptive dad was my abuser, and he was like looked at as. Uh, Mr. Huxtable, I don't know if y'all know about Mr. and Mrs. Huxtable, but it was perfect. And no one thought that he would do anything wrong, but he did wrong to me. So kids like that are looked at like demon child. Uh, uh, you're just like wicked if you was to even speak badly on, you know, his uh, on someone's name who's helping out the community. Um, by him being a foster parent, it's him helping out the community, I guess, in his eyes. But um, he had secret agendas with me, and I didn't have the right adults asking me the right questions. I had a therapist for eight years, and she was not asking me the right questions. So what I would say will, will be, because um, if somebody asked me the right question about what he was doing to me, I, I'm pretty sure I would have said it, and I'm pretty sure they he would not be a foster dad right now to this day. So. They need to have child developers in the communities of uh, at least safe havens for kids to be able to feel comfortable because when you're asking children about sexual questions, they're not going to just, well, I'm not a child developer, but I'm, they're not going to just say it like, you have to ask them the right questions is what I'm saying. And when you have the right adults asking the right questions, that can really help out a lot with children that's going through things that they can't talk about because I was told not to say anything. So because I didn't say nothing, I thought that it was still okay what he was trying to do to me, but it wasn't. So, and I didn't know that until I became an adult. So 
I was a, I would say that we need safe havens in the communities and safe havens in schools. And they need to they need to be able to stop the cycle in the beginning and not let it lead out to being an adult. Because when you let it lead out to being an adult, it looks like it, it looks it just looks real bad and everything's just and because it's the only support system I've ever had, that's the only bridge I ever had. And I burned that bridge. I had to rebuild it back up, but I had to rebuild it back up by saying I lied. He didn't try to do that, but it really was the truth. And I don't want someone to have to say they lied just because that's the only family they know. Or that's the only thing they have because they don't, they real people don't have, like, they don't have nobody else. And when you in foster care, people say you burn your bridges and all of that when you get put out and stuff, but you really don't have no bridges to, bridges to burn because there, there was never no bridge. You uh, never had nobody, especially if you're in foster care. It's really seldom you find somebody who really have your best interests at heart. No one really has anyone's best interest at heart unless they really care about that person. So I feel like a lot of foster parents do it for selfishness reasons, like money or for like free, you know, benefits from the government. So I just think that also they need to find when they do foster uh, care, they need to find people who are more genuine, not people who are just trying to get something out of the deal like people who are really trying to do it to help our children and really trying to like not break them but make them a better person and make them better from their circumstances thank you thank you so much for sharing uh frida final words before we turn it back over um i just want the policymakers to consider that everyone is everyone that is homeless is not homeless by choice that they done got into a situation that they can't get out of. Something devastating has happened. And it's people out there that look like me, clean, who's working, taking care of their family, taking care of their kids. But it's rules to this, like um, a three-year eviction rule. Once you have an eviction on your record, you got to wait three years just to um, get an apartment because your eviction got to be three years old. I just want them to consider that that everybody who is homeless is not on drugs, not on alcohol. That people is really out here trying, trying to do better, and they want better. And I just wish that the, pol the policymakers will try their best to get more affordable housing or um, family shelter programs, anything to help people get up out the situation that they in and to be more successful. Thank you, Frida. Thank all of you, Barbara. Thank you, April, Frida, Julie, and Destiny. Uh, Yori emailed me right before this, and she said um, the phrase unfiltered truth. And that is what you have provided this afternoon. So we thank you for your unfiltered truth. Now more than ever, we need that as policymakers come together to figure out how to tackle this next piece around the pandemic. And thank you, Yori too, for uh, facilitating the conversations, getting to know our expert panelists and bringing us all together. I want to take a little bit, just a little bit, to go over some of the policy asks and the urgent asks we have for Congress, and then we have a little bit of time for some questions and answers from our, our audience. So our, uh, the four organizations who have put together this briefing, we do support broader efforts around housing, employment, education, child care, health care. Um, economic stimulus payments, the, the total package, because as we've heard here, this is a multifaceted challenge infecting children and parents and families. Some of the specific pieces that we are advocating for right now as Congress comes together are listed on this next slide. The Emergency Family Stabilization Act, introduced in the Senate and soon to be introduced in the House, will provide direct funding to community-based agencies to provide emergency services related to housing, <laughs> education, <laughs> child care, um, to, uh, uh, am I getting a little bit of feedback? I don't know if I can, okay, well, I think it finally went away there. Um, that legislation uh, would not require a family to meet HUD's definition of homeless. Several of you spoke about not meeting the criteria because of where you were staying or other conditions. So the broader definition of homelessness that is used by schools, staying with somebody temporarily, staying in motels, as April described, that would be, you would be considered eligible for help through a wide variety. Also, um, the, the we are specifically advocating for more help for schools, specifically programs like Project Connect, which Ms. Mason 
uh, talked about and all the help that, that they are doing. Right now, that program, the Education for Homeless Children program, is the only federal education program specifically focused on children, youth, and families who are experiencing homelessness and making sure that there's continuity in education. I'm thinking, Julie, about how you heard about the night ministry through uh, a teacher um, and thinking about the various connections, um, you know, Destiny, too, in terms of your education um, and, April, the support that your children were provided. So that's another big advocacy ask. We're also asking for more funding for the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act program, for programs like the Night Ministry, programs like Covenant House, to be able to support our youth and young adults, including those who are parenting, and also asking for changes in housing policy to recognize the face of homelessness, the face of homelessness that April and all of you have described, so it is broader and more reflective of how children and youth experience homelessness. Those are our urgent policy asks, and I think um, just to, if we can go to the next slide, I want to. Um, Send over Yori a uh, question right now. Um, a couple more, and then we'll, we'll wrap up at, at 3:30. But I do want to take um, a couple of questions that we have from our audience. So the first question is for April. Um, someone wants to know if you think families experiencing homelessness struggle with exposing their homeless status through virtual learning. The families. Um, we work with have stated so and simply stopped participating in online learning. Oh, oh wow. To answer that question, absolutely. Um, I'll tell you, I moved to Chatham, New Jersey, which is a very upper echelon part of New Jersey because I believed that I was going to be able to give my kids the best education possible. It was part of the reason I chose to stay with a friend there. Once I lost housing in Chatham, they actually don't even have any housing options, period. They don't even have a program for it. If you can't afford to live there, then you can't be there. So um, I was not, it was, they were not really receptive. Um, I have a daughter who has an IEP. An IEP is like intervention learning services because maybe they have like a delay in reading or things like that. And um, I, I just, I was so overwhelmed and I felt like I completely just stopped. I stopped everything. My kids stopped doing their work. And so I understand. And, and yes, it's, it's embarrassing. You know, here I am. I just moved to this state in this great neighborhood, being able to give my kids a great education. And, um, you know, they were emailing me, parents were emailing and you know, they were wanting to connect kids and all of these things. And my kids were missing activities at, that they were doing online and FaceTiming for class and things like that. Well, I don't even have a computer. <laughs> so how are my kids going to, we don't have iPhones, but the teachers are saying, hey, let's FaceTime. Well, my kids don't have iPhones or cell phones. And so, of course, it absolutely, um, it just kind of rips you of your dignity because when you're already in a low place, um, you know, what do you do when you feel defeated? And so. I, I would I would agree with that 110%. Um, it, it, it's very difficult, it's, especially for moms of multiples. You know what I mean? I have two middle school students, two elementary school students, um, and it, it was just it was completely difficult. When you have 16 teachers emailing you at one time, and you're so overwhelmed, and you don't even know how you're going to cook dinner inside of a hotel room in a crock pot. It's like you kind of weigh weigh the odds. What what do I have to do? You know what I mean? And you don't want to explain your situation to each and every single teacher. So at some point, you're just like, forget it. You know what I mean? They'll just have to, you know, you you've put it off basically. You know what I mean? And so, I that's exactly what happens. That feeling of overwhelmness, feeling defeated. Like I said, if you have middle school students, you got 16 teachers. If you got four kids, you got, you know, it's 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 so overwhelming, especially when you don't have the resources. Thank you, April. Um, any other final things that any of you want to say before we close? Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, if y'all can hear me, I just wanted to say something to the ladies. Um, I just want to tell y'all to stay strong. We all have so much power within us, you wouldn't even know. 
keep pushing. Everybody has a story. We can all write a book. Do not give up, period. We can't give up. We all have children. Show your kids how strong you are. When my kids came to me and they said, hey, mama, you done been robbed. You done been shot at. You still standing. We homeless, but you still standing. You still moving forward. We got so much power within us. Just move forward and believe in yourself. And trust me, you will get to where you need to be. This is not the end. It's just the beginning to a beautiful future that you are going to have. And that's what I wanted to say to the ladies. Thank you for that. I wanted to say to the policymakers, and this is April speaking. One of the things that I experienced throughout my whole process in homelessness is that some of the agencies don't have any accountability. When you have people who are already down and in a low place within themselves and you walk into an agency and you are treated where they won't even look up and look at you in your face, these people are receiving grants and funds. And then you you sign up for these programs and you get a gift card and the mail and you get a T-shirt. But that's the extent of it. There are thousands of programs. But most of them are what you call referral services. You call one place and they send you to the next. You call one place and they send you to the next. The next, we are in need of agencies that provide direct service because you become discouraged. The information that's put out there is not always made visible. When I was denied benefits for um, my, my cash benefits and my food stamp benefits, Yes, I was told that I could um, appeal it and request a hearing, but how was I going to get there? No information was shared to me that the agency itself had to provide me a way to get there. Those small details that are available to us, when we're sitting around three and four hours in the lobby, share that type of information. Share the information that is valid. And it's like um, the level of human kindness. It just doesn't exist, and I think that they need to be accountable. Your jobs are in place because of people that are in need. So when you walk into a room and somebody's already low and they head down and they already feeling bad, somebody should be accountable to that staff to make them look up and say, hello, how was your day? Good morning. Not next. Those things matter because for people that are already on the verge, for people that are already broken, it could be that one nasty attitude or that one last comment that sends you into defeat of your own self. And so I ask that they consider when you have these agencies that you guys put policies in place to ensure that they take into consideration the mindset of the communities that they serve. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It's okay if you don't. Okay. I'm going to take that as a oh. no. As we close, I definitely want to extend gratitude again um, to you, Barbara, for organizing, for putting the policy charges out there, to the congressman, specifically Congressman Davis and Stivers, who was able to join and listen, and will take this information back to their colleagues, um, but specifically to you, April, Julie, Destiny, and Frida, um, thank you today for your stories, for your bravery, for your truth, um, for just being willing to speak your truth to power. Know that by sharing your stories with us, you have certainly inspired me, right? And I'm sure every other person who has listened and who is listening to do more, to do more for you and specifically for moms and children in our communities and just know that you you are an inspiration. Um, Congressman Davis said it, you are our sheroes and heroes um, who inspire us to kind of keep pushing forward unrelentingly, right? So that we can kind of get things moving for you and other um, young moms and families like yourselves in this nation so that no one has to experience many of the horrible things and tragic things that you have experienced and are still experiencing. So thank you for your time and for your voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, and I think we'll just close um, with, um, for those of you who are watching online, 
um, some resources on the slides about all of our organizations. And on the final slide, um, if you could advance uh, just ways to stay in touch uh, on social media. And again, we'll have uh, another uh, briefing next week with uh, youth and family providers and some McKinney-Vento liaisons as well on, uh, I believe it's Wednesday at 4.30 Eastern. So I invite you to join that. And again, just want to thank again our amazing expert parent panelists and Yori, and um, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.